And now I will clear out of the way well, the one and the only Larry Wall. I can do that too. My keyboard on? Well, um, actually, today I'll, I'll need all the support I can get. Uh, I'm running an experiment today in sleep deprivation. Uh, actually, I've been running an experiment in sleep deprivation for the last six months or so. Uh, if what I say today comes out like total mush, well, you can just assume that I used up all my pitiful supply of good writing for that little book some of you have been carrying around. Uh, I decided to talk about music this year because I talked about chemistry last year. The two are naturally associated in my, in my brain for some reason. Of course, um, all music can be viewed as better living through chemistry, uh, brain chemistry, that is. Here, uh, have some neurotransmitters. <laughs> happier? <laughs> this talk will mostly be auditory, but for you people who are visually, visually oriented, I have a stop. Um, here are, if we get this uh, screen up here, I have some uh, new tokens that we'll be adding to Perl. Can we get this screen up? Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, these are some of the Unicode characters that are in the uh, process of being approved up in the uh, surrogate area. But, you know, UTF-8 can handle that. Um, you know, I can't wait till I can uh, overload some of these as operators. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not entirely sure what dollar $A trill dollar B would mean. But it'll, it'll do something to your neurotransmitters. Uh, but neurotransmitters aside, chemistry and music are also associated uh, in my mind because uh, although I eventually graduated in computers and linguistics, uh, for my first two years in college, I was pursuing a double major in chemistry and music. Uh, kind of the story of my life that I've always been interested in too many things. Uh, jack of all trades and master of maybe one. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I've uttered that phrase chemistry and music so often that it's almost a Pavlovian response. Uh, hey, Larry. You talked about chemistry last year. What are you going to talk about this year? <laughs> slobber, slobber, slobber. I'll talk about music. <clears throat> it wasn't until three days ago, though, that I actually sat down and asked my left brain, why do you want to talk about music this year? Uh, I don't know. Ask my right brain. I am your right brain, stupid. <laughs> <clears throat> I think part of the answer is that I worry about how Pearl culture is going to grow up. You know, if any of you have kids, you know that kids are complex, and they get more complex as they get older. Fortunately, there's only so much complexity that any one kid can hold, and either they uh, eventually go insane, or if you're really lucky, they go sane. Uh, even so, understanding any individual completely is impossible. But pearl culture is composed of many people, and so the complexity of pearl co culture can grow without bounds. Uh, no one person can understand pearl com culture completely. If the complexity of pearl culture is going to continue to grow beyond the ability of any one person to fathom, even me, how can we continue to think constructively about it? I believe that we must learn to apply constructive analogies from other systems that are too complicated to understand completely. On the one hand, we can pull, complex, uh, pull ideas from those sciences that have had to deal with overwhelming complexity, such as chemistry, biology, neurophysiology, so on. On the other hand, the more humanistic uh, pursuits have always been overwhelmed by complexity, uh, whether you're talking about sociology or political science. You can study literature all your life and not even read everything you're supposed to read, let alone what you want to read. Music is the same way. Uh, many of us know thousands of songs or musical pieces, but nobody can know them all. Even if you could somehow combine all the songs that are currently playing somewhere in the world 
it would just come out as pink noise. Terribly musical. Um, and that's exactly how your brain feels if you've read too many Perl mailing lists all at once. Um, uh, only God can hear all the songs that are being played simultaneously, and only God can read all the simultaneous mailing lists, news groups, and websites of the world. Pretty soon, only God will be able to understand the CPAN. <laughs> As humans, we have to simplify. In fact, we must oversimplify. We all specialize. We can focus in on one style of music, or on a particular piece of music, or on a particular instrument. We can focus on rhythm, or harmony, or melody. We can focus on uh, any of the ways that music affects our moods, whether tied directly to words, or subtly as background music in a movie, or background music in an elevator. Uh, we can focus on any of who, what, where, why, when, or how. On a good day, we can focus on several things but we can never focus on all of them. So for the rest of this talk, I'd like to oversimplify Pearl culture by looking at it through the lens of music culture. Now, the problem with music culture is, of course, that although it makes a nice analogy, it's also too complicated to talk about or even think about. So I brought along a few props. Um, you can think of them as extension modules. Uh, extension modules come in all shapes and sizes. Of course, you can program without extension modules, those of you who have evolved far enough to have opposable thumbs have a built-in percussion instrument. Okay, that's a snap, of course. Uh, with a little work, you can develop a crackle and a pop as well. To do the crackle, you first learn to snap twice with each hand. And then you combine them in sequence. Okay, that's your crackle. To do a pop, you just make a little resonant cavity with your one hand and go something like that. Um, and uh, then you get, you know, things like that. Um, uh, long, long ago at a campfire far away, somebody discovered that pigs have spare ribs. Um, at least they're spare after all the meat is gone. Um, well, at least the pig doesn't need them anymore. Um, let me just over here. No, not, not yet. Now, if you... Um, Work these just right. You, know, you can you can get a kind of a triple rhythm. You know, they say it's all in the wrist. Well, I'm gonna have to bone up on that. Uh. Here's a more intuitive interface. Uh, these are called you know, clavies. At least these would be called clavies if they were from Spain, but they're not. Uh, they're from Papua New Guinea, and so I have no idea what they're called there. Uh, I've asked various people from Papua New Guinea what they're called, and they have no idea either. <laughs> They're probably called about 750 different things, since that's about how many languages there are in New Guinea. Every time you go over a hill, the next tribe speaks an entirely different language. It's like being in your typical computer science department, where every professor wants you to learn their favorite computer language, which is different from the other 750 favorite computer languages of all the other professors. Um, I suppose you could think of these as opposable sticks. Though, in the history of our species, sticks have usually been opposed to Uh Eventually, our ancestors got tired of grilled spare ribs, so they figured out how to boil pigs. Not long after that, they discovered soup. And not long after that, they invented the spoon. The technology was developing really fast back then. 
Anyway, shortly after they invented the spoon, they invented two spoons because that way they didn't have to share. Um, now, this, this module is actually rather awkward to use, kind of like a, a Perl form module. Uh, um, that's the same sort of, well, no, I got a better thing. Here's the, uh, Perl 5 version of the same module. Okay. Now I am going to move this over. We have the technology. We don't need the technology. <laughs> okay. Now we're missing the technology and okay. Um, okay. Uh, back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, this, you know, is the same sort of noise you get when two people butt heads uh, against each other in Perl 5 quarters, you know. Uh, that's what oppositional behavior sounds like. Uh, the entire field of percussion is based on oppositional behavior. That is, two objects trying to occupy the same space at the same time. So this is, you know, definitely an, an object-oriented module. You notice the relationship between these two spoons has been encapsulated um, so that the user no longer has to specify it explicitly. And actually, this is the second version of this module. Um, unfortunately, one of my kids broke the encapsulation on the first uh, version. Uh, but in fact, uh, all all uh, percussion instruments are uh, um, object oriented. Yeah, lots of fun. Um, percussion instruments is, uh, are object-oriented, as I said. Uh, after all, they, they indicate the rhythm, right? And rhythm is object-oriented. You look like you don't believe me. Rhythm, rhythm really is object-oriented. Surely you've all heard of the rhythm method. Furthermore, uh, you'll note that people who use the rhythm method are frequently members of Lamaze class. <laughs> Personally, I've been through three Lamaze classes. Um, so has my wife. Uh, um, now, many of you know that we have four kids. Uh, for our fourth kid, they told us not to come back. Um, since it was obvious we already knew all there was to know about heavy breathing. Um, <laughs> actually, the Lamaze techniques are an interesting application of rhythm for the purpose of distracting the participants with pantings of various sorts. Okay, honey, now do sixes, twos, threes, sevens, and fives. Not necessarily in that order. Nurse, take my husband, please. In the abstract, rhythm is about event programming, kind of like uh, a Geiger counter. Uh, here's our current background radiation. Here's if you sit too close to the TV in your hotel room. Those of you who know Morse code probably know what that said. I don't. Uh, uh, if you don't care to sit too close to your TV, just move to Boulder, uh, or or stay here and you know wait for the uh, Diablo Canyon reactor to melt down. Uh, 
random events aren't really all that interesting, however. It gets more interesting when you program which events happen when. And you can do all sorts of, don't do that. None of that. Um, other than little games like that, there's there's really only one sound that spoons can make. Uh, the conga drums, by contrast, provide a, a richer interface. You can think of the uh, interface as parameterized in several different dimensions, most of which are infinitely variable. Uh, but for all its uh, richness, it's still an event-driven module. Um, Perl also has an event module, and it's Maybe a little more portable than these, but you could use a little more work on that. Uh, but you can do some various interesting uh, event loops on these things. Uh, you know. uh, and so on. Now, as, as a linguist trained in tag mimics, I tend to think of these things in terms of fields, waves, and particles. You know, har harmony is uh, harmony is a field while uh, melody is a wave. I think of rhythm as, as particles where the events are the points at which things happen. Actually, it's, it's the events themselves that are particles, but rhythm itself is a higher level of, of abstraction, sort of connecting the dots in our heads. So event questions start with, with when, while rhythm questions tend to start with how often. Like, how often should we have a Pearl conference? How often should we have a Pearl World Cruise? Um, actually, uh, it's, it's, it's like this. Uh, it's it's a, a three against two rhythm, uh, sort of a hemiola. Uh, the Pearl Conference is once a year, while the Pearl Cruise is, is scheduled to be once every 18 months, which gives you three beats in one hand to every two beats in the other. Uh, here's, three be here's three beats against four. Um, Three against five. Uh, if you want to figure these out for yourself, it's really just a bit of math. Uh, multiply the two numbers to find out how many subdivisions you need. With three against four, you need 12 subdivisions, and with three against five, 15. You can just chart it out. Now, in reality, the rhythm of Pearl culture is, is more of a fractal with many smaller interactions for all the larger ones. You know, here's a Pearl conference. But just all sorts of uh, stuff going on in the interstices. But uh, speaking of fractals, I noticed an interesting thing about the rhythm of releases. Uh, as the size of the Perl core and libraries gets bigger, it takes longer to rev a major release. So they naturally get slower. You know? Perl 1, Perl 2, Perl 3, Perl 4, <laughs> Perl 5. And then we start getting sub-releases. <laughs> And then they get slower. And then we get sub subversions. <laughs> and they get slower and slower. Eventually, the, the subversions are, are taking as long as the, the, uh, the, the original Perl 1, Perl 2 thing, but that's because they're, they're actually accomplishing just as much. Um, anyway, that's just, I just thought that was interesting. In compensation, um, uh, now, up till now, we've seen instruments that uh, specialize in rhythm, which is a, a particle effect. In contrast, there are uh, other instruments that specialize in harmony and melody. Here is an auto harp. Just, you know, it's always on the wrong side. Oof. Uh. Well, uh, you push the buttons and you get harmony. It's almost a pure harmony instrument. With a little bit of rhythm on the, on the strum level. Uh, but uh, harmony is, is an abstraction, a construct we manufacture in our own minds. Unlike rhythm, 
Harmony is spread out in the pitch dimension and behaves as a, as a field. By that I mean it seems to fill space in a way that neither rhythm nor melody does. You can play rhythms and melodies simultaneously, and they tend to keep their individual identities. Uh, but if you try playing two chords simultaneously, you either get a different chord from either of them, or you just get mush. Um, interestingly, you can't actually add two chords together on an auto harp because an auto harp builds harmon harmonies by subtraction, not by addition. You know, it's like trying to mix paints when you ought to be mixing light. The more you try to mix, the less you end up with. To uh, you know, so we uh, it, it subtract some notes to get the uh, what we want, and we subtract we get fewer and fewer notes. Eventually, we get no notes. That's not the way to mix harmony. Uh, to actually mix harmony, you you need uh, an additive device like a keyboard. Now that does not sound like that. No, it doesn't sound like that. But something else again entirely. We talk about a lot about harmony in uh, pearl culture. Uh, actually, we yell at each other a lot about harmony in pearl culture. <laughs> but but it's very harmonious yelling. Um, remember that harmony tends to monopolize your mental space, uh, but that's kind of an illusion. It's easy when you hear two people arguing in a public forum to think that the entire forum is bogus, but if you look carefully, there's usually still a background of non-fighting going on as well. Uh, nor do people fight all the time. It just seems that way. We try to fit too many notes into the same mental space. But uh, you don't actually have to harmonize every note everywhere all at once. We have different locations. Different chords can happen, happen in different places. Uh, different pieces have different standards for dissonance, and that's fine. You know, maybe a Pearl Friends mailing list would be like Mozart, and Compline Pearl Misk is like Schoenberg mixed with John Cage with Metallica thrown in for good measure. Um, Pearl Five Quarters is, is slightly more civilized. It's a bit like late Mahler, where part of the time the music is atonal and tortured, and the rest of the time the music is tonal, but still tortured. Actually, I, I like Mahler an awful lot. He's my favorite composer. And this is no co coincidence. Uh, Mahler once said he always tried to put the whole world into each of his symphonies. Um, note also that my favorite author is Tolkien, who also put a, a, an entire world into his work. Uh, so perhaps it's kind of natural that I try to hook up the entire wor world to Pearl one way or another. Of course, you, you can't have the whole world in one spot without accepting a certain amount of dissonance. Uh, but there's another form of abstraction, uh, which we call melody. In some ways, it's the most mysterious because, in fact, it really is object-oriented in a deep way. A melody is a sequence of notes that we ex that we perceive to have been played or performed by a single object, which we often call a voice, even if it isn't one. Object permanence is something we learn at a young age. That's why we play peekaboo. Uh, to figure out that mommy didn't actually disappear when she went behind the towel. Uh, similarly, you can take temporarily separate notes and creatively imagine that they came from the same instrument. Uh, how many of you have ever played the, the computer game, The Seventh Guest? Some of you. Okay. Uh, you may recognize this melody, which is permanently burned into my personal EEPROM. Not that. I, I blew it. Okay. And then you solve that particular puzzle. Um, I hope I didn't give anything away. <laughs> um, that game intentionally makes it really hard to follow the melody since it treats the notes as discrete. But you know, some instruments make it really easy to follow a melody by, by making the transitions continuous. Life is always interesting, isn't it? Okay. I wonder how you play one of these things. Okay. 
So you need a, a double inflection point, a double inflection here, or a double curve, and you find the inflection point in the middle. Maybe. Try for Mary Had a Little Lamb. I don't know who first came up with the idea of playing a saw. It, it's not what you call obvious. On the other hand, uh, some things are so obvious that if one person didn't invent it, the next person would. For example, whistling. Hmm. Another rather obvious invention, I think, is, is bottle whistle. Perrier works really great for this. You know, as W.C. Fields once said, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Actually, a bottle in front of you doesn't have a lot to recommend it either. In particular, the melodies you can play with this module are rather monotonic, not to mention monotonous. Um, here's the William Tell Overture on the bottle. Other wind instruments can at least uh, vary the pitch parameter, but most wind instruments are by nature melodic in that they can only produce one single note at a time. There are, there are exceptions, of course. Take the bagpipes, please. <laughs> I don't think the bagpipes are an obvious interface either. Uh, I don't know whether playing your hands would be considered obvious or not. I don't know why, but you have to wet your whistle to do this. Doesn't make sense to me. I, I discovered that one by accident myself. One day I was leaning on a table with my hands folded, and I just happened to blow in my hands to maybe warm them or something. Can't do it anymore, can I? Well, this is actually the hard way, you see, with the fingers uh, inter interlaced. Yeah. Um, now, but this, this actually is, illustrates a very important musical technique, uh, one, of the, one that many of us have had to learn repeatedly. Oddly, this technique is called unlearning. Uh, it's like backtracking well, in real life. Sometimes you have to make negative progress in order to go forward in the long run. For instance, when I started taking private lessons on the violin, I had to unlearn, unlearn a year's worth of bad habits I'd picked up in school. Now, in the case of playing my hands, I had to learn to hold my hands a different way if I wanted to have greater pitch range. So uh, once I'd relearned how to play my hands, I could get almost an octave. Uh, that leaves out the Star Spangled Banner, but you know, there's lots of melodies that'll fit into an octave. Um. have that octave. I'm going to tune it up here a little bit. <laughs> Which is, of course, how much is that camel in the window? <laughs> um, of course, you can do much, much the same thing with, with an extension uh, mechanism that, that's official, you know. They want to play the box.
Thank you. This is my wife. Okay. Obviously, that's my main instrument. Uh, and certainly one of the most obvious uh, wind instruments is your voice. Uh, at least we, we certainly produce a lot of wind with our voice. Uh, but uh, now I'm not going to sing anything operatic for you. And um, although I'm preaching to the choir, I'm not going to make you sing either. That should play something on my computer. We have ways to make you talk. Yeah, I know. I'm a sound engineer uh, in my church. I'm allowed to do that. Anyway, uh, but you'll recall uh, that melody is, is an abstraction of object permanence. As I mentioned earlier, musicians call such an object a voice, whether it's really a human voice or any of the other instruments. But the really interesting thing to me is the relationship of melody to harmony. And it has to do with what we call voice leading. Um, here's a guitar. Yep, that's a guitar. I need to be pickier. I'm picky. Um, you can play in a uh, guitar in many styles, but the most notable feature of the guitar is, is how much it's used for harmony rather than melody, regardless of the style. Um, I don't want the pick yet. Here's uh, something else. Something like that. Um, of course, if you're a classical guitarist, you do a lot of melody, too. But the, the very basis of harmony is all the little melodies going on in the middle of the chords. And you can he actually hear the little waves in there if you, if you listen. You hear a chord change. Still a little closer than that, yeah. But you hear things like this happening in the middle and things like that, little voices. And so the, the harmony is actually uh, out of reductionist in a reductionist uh, fashion, it's, it's, it's uh, just a bunch of little harmonies, but hol holistically, melodies. But holistically, it, 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 you don't perceive it that way. It's it perceived as a field. Um, you know, so, so you don't, you don't when you, you hear chords, you don't actually hear the individual notes. You, you somehow intuit the whole, um, the whole uh, whatever it is. You ever notice that music is sometimes hard to talk about? I never have any trouble talking about Pearl. Um, anyway, the bottom, bottom note of a chord is kind of in a privileged position. It, it behaves more like a melody of its own. But it's a funny kind of melody in that it's perceived to drive the rhythm and, and the harmony. If you take the bottom four strings of a guitar and drop them an octave, you get uh, one of these. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get the slouch right here, right here. Ready? you will think that that's uh, Mission Impossible, but that's actually uh, Man from Uncle, uh, which was <laughs> my uh, my favorite show when I was young. Uh, open Channel D. Uh, but um, here, here's Mission Impossible. Right, okay, well. 
bass guitar is really fun, even if you're not good at it. <clears throat> Sometimes I think I'm the bass guitarist of Pearl Culture. You know, I play this strange melody, and then a whole bunch of other people start playing these strange rhythms and harmonies around me. Um, but now we're going to go back to hitting things again. Um, This is what is known as a hammer dulcimer. It actually belongs to my wife, whom I like, because she lets me borrow her things. And in it, the, the one thing that about this uh, that you know is, is, is harder on other instruments, especially wind instruments, is actually multi-threaded. It, it, the beginnings of multi-threading it has two two separate threads of control. Um, so. See what shall I play? Um, okay. Nope. all night the day I left, the weather it was dry. It got so hot I froze to death. Susanna, Susanna, don't you cry. Musicians delight in contradictions, but uh, so do language designers. You have to be able to see both sides of every question when you design a language. It helps to have uh, multiple personality disorder. Um, it also helps to have a, a multi-threaded interface like, like a piano. Piano is just a, a fancier uh, interface for a dulcimer, in a way. Uh, it still has hammers. A real piano does. They go out and uh, strike the strings, uh, in you know another form of oppositional behavior. But uh, it's a percussion instrument, in other words. But it, it happens to have a pitch <laughs> parameter as well. Uh, it also has a more developed multi-threading model. It, it supports up to ten threads in two groups of five. Um, Advanced implementations can handle 20 threads, but that requires two CPUs. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm afraid the piano module must still be considered experimental. Uh, still, the interface is somewhat user-friendly. I don't actually have time to talk about counterpoint, except to say that this simple tune illustrates the two contrapuddle principles we see in the Pearl community, uh, contrary motion and parallel motion. Contrary motion is when you have two programmers, or that is melodies, going in opposite directions. Uh, parallel motion is when the programmers agree on how to get where they're going. Actually, I joked about uh, it being experimental, but the piano interface is uh, actually one of the most standard interfaces we have. Unfortunately, uh, organs are not so standard. Once you get away from the keyboard itself, how you set one particular stop uh, really depends on the kind of organ you have. Um, in pipe organs, you might pull out one of the, the stop puller outers. Um, on a Hammond organ, you might just adjust the drawbar. On this organ, I push D35. Um, gotta love Bach. Next time someone says Pearl is Baroque, thank them for the compliment.
they say it's easy to get a composer out of bed in the morning. All you have to do is go over to the piano, or, or the organ in this case, and play an unresolved chord. Then they have to get out of bed and, and resolve the chord. <laughs> Hard, I can't stand it. Now, I promised I'd bring my violin, and as you can see, I didn't break my arm in Aikido, so I guess I'll have to play it some. Uh, the violin is one of those you know, traditional, standard instruments. As I say, nobody ever got fired for buying a symphony orchestra. Um, <laughs> but if, if you do get fired, your orchestra can play for you, you know. Um, <laughs> Very sad. Uh, there's a lot of happy music too. But, you know, uh, violin is actually two different instruments, and and I actually brought it here to uh, illustrate polymorphism. Uh, people ask what's the difference between a violin and a fiddle. There, there's no difference really. It, it only depends on which class you call the method from. Um, here, here's the fiddle interface. You just choke up on the bow a little bit. Here. And, uh, people who claim to be tone deaf can nonetheless recognize various styles of music when they hear them. You know, our pattern metric capabilities are, are usually much better than we admit. In fact, Pearl's design banks on that. Uh, that last little bit of music actually can stand on its own. Uh, it's usually known as shaving a haircut two bit. So music also has its one-liners. Um, yeah. here, here's, uh, here's another piece known as the Mousetrap Concerto. <laughs> Actually, I played a lot of serious music in my, on my violin. It was uh, my privilege to spend six years in the Seattle Youth Symphony under the direction of Willem Sokol. There wasn't anything we couldn't play, but we just had to work at it a little longer than a, a professional orchestra would. Um, it reminds me of pearl development sometimes. Um, one thing I learned while playing in various orchestras is the, is the importance of faking it. You have to be able to fake playing an instrument before you can really play it. And I'm faking most of these instruments. Um, my whole first year in the Youth Symphony, I was petrified that I might get called upon during rehearsal to play a part that I wasn't ready to play. Fortunately, I was never called upon. My second year, I made a startling discovery. I just learned the, the music uh, thoroughly, and then I didn't have to worry about whether anybody uh, called on me to play it. You know, how does this play out in Pearl culture? Well, we have to be willing to let people fake it for a while. If Pearl is getting their job done, then that's fine. But we also have to find ways of encouraging people to upgrade their abilities when they're ready for that step. And we don't do that by beating them over the head. We do it by showing the positive benefits of learning Pearl for real. Uh, uh, now, I probably could have actually been a professional violinist. Uh, had and Hyde, I'd been only interested in music, I might have been, but then I wouldn't be up here uh, waving around it, a violin around at you. Um, but uh, I'd also like to use this violin to illustrate reusability. Uh, something like that. Well. You know, I, I don't think William Tell would have minded the Lone Ranger using his music, but when I was growing up, there were still cigarette commercials on TV, and sometimes you heard, have a lark, have a lark, have a lark today. Later on, it was, have a pizza, have a pizza, have a pizza, roll. 
I'm sure William Tell would just love to shoot a pizza roll off someone's head. Um, and finally, I'd like to finally introduce uh, officially my uh, synthesizer here, Core Guy 5S, meet Pearl Hackers. Pearl Hackers meet Core Guy 5S. Um, I've been pretending it's a piano and an organ and any number of other things, but it's really just a bunch of switches and oscillators and such. Uh, like Pearl, it can be viewed as a, a tool that got out of hand. Um, <laughs> Like Pearl, it can be viewed um, as just another tool in the toolbox as well. Um, I joke that the piano interface was experimental, but this interface really is experimental. Keyboard interface is pretty standard, but uh, that's other things now. We hope they're better. Uh, nevertheless, it's it's awful lot of fun to use this thing in its current state. You know, kind of like Pearl. It, it does a pretty good job of emulating some other tools in the toolbox. For instance, uh Easier here than there. <laughs> Unless you're my wife. Well, she does it easier here too. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, um, the thing that's really cool about this keyboard is it can, it can play various different styles of music, you know, Tim Toady and all that. My favorite button is the one that locks in uh, different styles into the same tempo so that you can go from one uh, style to another and see how the same tune sounds in different cultural contexts. For example, how would Pachelbel's Canon come out if it were played by Mick and Keith, or by John, Paul, George, and Ringo, or by Elvis? Uh, well, we can find out. Tempo right here. Start this again. all day with that, but, uh, or that. One of the things we love about Perl is that it, it supports many different styles of programming. Uh, that's something we never want to lose with Perl. There's also just the, the intrinsic joy in making music that has nothing to do with whether we're using the music for some other purpose. Likewise, there's a, an intrinsic joy in programming in Perl that has nothing to do with the purpose we're putting it to. That is also something we never want to lose. In fact, there are many features we want to conserve in Perl, but music is continually reinventing itself, and so is Perl.
referral culture. Most music is evolutionary, not revolutionary. Uh, people don't usually riot over new music. Uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring being the exception that rules the rule. Uh, but people don't usually riot over new Perl modules either. But occasionally, there does come a time when we have to think like revolutionaries. Someone has to throw the tea into the Boston Harbor. Someone has to decide that it was time to write a document starting out when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But before that, someone had to decide to alter the course of human events. Yesterday, a bunch of us radicals decided that it was time to alter the course of human events. Some of you may have heard rumors of this. So today I'd like to announce to the world that the effort to write Perl 6 has begun in earnest. And I'd like to use the synthesizer to make uh, an important point. If you manufacture something like this, you eventually come to a point where you say, this is a really neat gizmo, but we can do something better. Uh, do we continue to make small improvements in the current design, or do we redesign the interface to let us do what we'd really like to do down the road? And if we do a redesign, can we keep everything people like about the old design while getting rid of all the things people don't like about the, the uh the thing they have right now. Well, that's kind of the state Pearl is in right now. We really, really like what we have. We like it a lot. But we can think of lots of ways we can do it better. And uh, the things we'd like to do better come in several categories. First, the language itself could use some revision. I'm allowed to admit that. <laughs> um, there are many historical warts on Pearl that wouldn't have been there if I'd known what I was doing. But, hey, I was faking it back then. You didn't know that, did you? Um, I'm more of a competent language designer than I was 13 years ago, and I have a lot more help these days. Plus, it's time to steal all the good ideas that we can from those other languages that developed in the last decade. Um, one of the things I realized yesterday was that we're actually in a much better position than when I designed Perl 5. Nowadays, we have code backends such as b colon colon d parse, they can spit out the Perl code corresponding to the compiled syntax tree. And if you think about that, it means that it would be relatively easy to make it spit out a closely uh, related language, such as Perl 6. Perl has always been designed to evolve, but now we actually have the capability of evolving a little faster. This means that, for the first time in history, we have the opportunity to make some incompatible fixes to Perl while preserving a migration path for the current code. And I really couldn't do that when I designed Perl 5. Uh, we had to make almost everything upward compatible, uh, or backward compatible, whichever one it is. But, you know, really, now it's the first chance to, to make that sort of changes, and since it is the first chance, it probably is also the last chance, so I think we should. Of course, we are not interested in breaking things just to break things, but I'm sure you can think of things you might have done differently. Myself, I really wish I'd made the system call uh, return true on success rather than false. <laughs> I wish I'd made local time return the actual year and not the year minus 1900. <laughs> I'd really love to throw out select file handle. Um, and there's, you know, there's general consensus that type blobs may have outlived their, their usefulness. <laughs> Um, and a number of simple but potentially powerful features have already been put on the table for consideration. That's not, going, that's not to say we're going to do all of them. My overriding goal for the redesign of the Perl language is that easy things should stay easy, hard things should get easier, and impossible things should get hard, as it were. <laughs> um, another place we'd like to do better is in the implementation of the language uh, as opposed to the language itself. Now, I, I think I did a pretty good job with the design of, the, the, of Perl 5 and making it extensible at the language level. But the internal APIs necessary to write extension modules could really use to be cleaned up. Some of you may have noticed that. I mean, we could, we could scrap excess for something better. Uh, and, and of course, we want the core to be smaller and faster, always. You know, I'd like to run, palm, uh, I'd like to run Perl on my palm. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, 
we could design the extension system so that installing a new version of Perl doesn't break all your existing extension modules. Um, we, we have many other ideas for improving the implementation as well, and, and uh, these will come filtering out. But neither language changes nor implementations, implementation changes will happen unless we also reinvent how we do things. So we've already started a redesign of Perl culture, trying to keep the good aspects and leaving behind the non-productive aspects. We intend to abandon the Perl 5 Porter's model of development, which demonstrably, demonstrably leads to a lot of talk but little action. Instead, we'll break down the design of Perl 6 and the maintenance of Perl 5 into manageable tasks given to meaningful working groups with meaningful charters uh, and meaningful goals. We have collectively resolved to make these working groups work and where they do not work, to work at making them work until they do work. We will continue to refine all aspects of our development model until every itch is scratched as efficiently as possible. We are really jazzed about this. It is our belief that if Perl culture is designed right, Perl will be able to evolve into the language we need 20 years from now. It's also our belief that only a radical rethinking of both the Perl language and its implementation can energize the community in the long run, where in the long run means 10 and 20 years down the road. Finally, it is our belief that Perl 5 itself will be better supported than it would be if we merely tried to guard what we already have. The best defense is a good offense. Now, this is not going to happen quickly. We expect to have alpha code a year from now, or some definition of alpha. We might even ship it. But we expect it to be well-designed alpha code. In the meantime, we're not abandoning Perl 5 anytime soon. We all like Perl 5 a lot. We all use it a lot. Many commercial interests will guarantee that Perl 5 continues to be well-maintained and stabilized for quite a few years to come. And we fully expect, given the history of Perl 4, that five years from now, a lot of people will still be using Perl 5. We do expect the rate of new development in Perl 5 to taper off, of course, and, and that can be viewed as a feature. Um, but you know, open source software specifically rejects the get big quick philosophy of the typical web startup. Such rapid growth tends to fragment the culture and in the long run leads to ruin. Instead, we intend to proceed at the fastest speed at which we can efficiently propagate our cultural values to newcomers in our culture, but no faster. This is the healthy way forward and the only way to compete in a competitive space. We have to be better, not just get there faster. Part of being better is making sure the stragglers don't be left behind. We are determined to do the right thing by everyone. To this we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, as it were. Um, what there is of it. Um, many more details of our plans will be coming out in the next few days and weeks. We'll tell you who has taken responsibility for what. Uh, we'll set out a road map, or a chart if you're into music, uh, of where we'd like to be when. Look at uh, www.pearl.org for more as time goes on. Things should be showing up there today even. But right now, I would like to call each of you to play your part, uh, whatever that part is. You yourselves are, are individual melodies. Your being here today may be an event that changes the course of your tune. Certainly, your being here with everyone else who is here today makes a kind of harmony, a lost chord that will never, never be played exactly the same again. Uh, together, we perform a, a contrapuntal jazz improvisation that can only be recorded imperfectly. Music has always been an ephemeral art, and even with CDs and DVDs, people still go to live concerts. So, remember, you were here when a new thing was born. Every Pearl Conference is a cool event because Pearl people are the best people in the world. In this age of mailing lists and web pages, it's really nice to get uh, personally acquainted with all the folks that you've met on the net. But this conference is not just about getting together with your buds. It's also about finding new friends, forming new bands, creating cool new sounds, maybe leading a, a record, maybe landing a recording contract on the CPAN. Um, sometimes it's about more than that. Today, it's about more than that. We're really serious about reinventing everything that needs reinventing. 
the way I look at it, Pearl 5 was a composition largely by a single composer, me. It's a fine classical composition, but in essence, it's just one person's view of how to make music. If you work with Pearl 5, you have to follow the score pretty closely. Pearl 6 is going to be designed by the community. We're going to be doing some jamming. I'll still be exercising some artistic control over the language itself, but instead of playing off a score, we're going to be playing off charts now. And you're going to be seeing a lot of people improvising melodies of their own and interweaving them creatively in ways that will make Pearl 6 much better than Pearl 5, just as Pearl, six, Pearl 5 was much better than Pearl 4. And if you know anything about me, you know I take the promised land quite seriously. We're uh, all going to march in there someday. Larry, would you be willing to do a Q and A? If you'll help, I'll help. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to. I'd like to introduce our, our interim program manager for Pearl Six. Oh, we got that out of the way. Yeah. Question right there. Is, is Perl 6 going to be in C++? Maybe. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah, um, you know, Chip, Chip has a lot of experience with with uh, thinking about Perl and C++, and uh, and we intend to use the lessons he's learned one way or another. Well, it'll come out in stages. Um, we are, uh, in, in cultural terms, we are starting working on it already. Um, and uh, over the next uh, month or so, you are going to see the uh, the chart, the roadmap come out. And um, uh, my own personal goal, uh, for some reason, they, they they wanted me to take the position of uh, language designer. Um, of course, I'll have a lot of help on that. But uh, my goal for that part of it, uh, I'm giving a talk at uh, at Linux World Expo. Expo in Atlanta uh, in October, and they wanted me to do a keynote there, and I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Well, now I do. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the, um, the new Perl, where it's going, uh, as, as a language. Uh, the language design is, is now going to be separate from the implementation design, and we've got a number of other positions that we've... Uh, Named names for, and you'll see those if you if you look at the uh, the press release. But um, uh, the the uh, the schedule is not nailed down yet. But uh, you know we'll we'll try to act a bit like pointy-haired bosses and, and do some of that scheduling. Specs that are different from the code. What specs? <laughs> you mean how you how's he going to change from Perl five? What kind of things is he going to change? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll call for example like our, our specs, and then you know you could implement something that looks like this, or we'll like this thing like that, or this is all like. Yeah, I don't know how how strict a spec it will be uh, from the language design point of view. I'm not I'm not really big on that sort of spec, but. Um, you know, and there's there is some value to, to using the reference implementation approach. And what we have is a reference. What we currently have is a reference implementation with no second implementation. Uh, 
well, unless you count the JVM uh, work, but um, you know, obviously there there are benefits to having uh, things specified well enough that you could implement another one even if you didn't want to. So uh, we'll we'll definitely be working that direction. And um, you have something? Okay. Um, and um, there's something else I was going to say. Uh, what, what we particularly want to stress in terms of, of uh, is not, not perhaps so much the spec as developing our current uh, regression tests. Well, we call them regression tests, but they're, they're almost more acceptance tests. Uh, but, you know, you develop our acceptance tests into re real regression tests, then you further develop the real regression tests into a validation test of what the language actually means and actually go out and explore all the nooks and crannies and say, this is Perl, this is not Perl. Um, and then, then we, we actually have a, a machine-readable spec. And to me, that's, that's actually a lot more important than, than what the verbiage uh, on the uh, human-readable thing says. These gentlemen standing in the middle here actually have microphones. So if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to um, go over there, and that way the rest of the audience will be able to hear what your question is. I think you just cycled all the rest of the questions. Low blood sugar fits. Huh? Oh, um, would, would you be able to? Um, there we go. I know the cure for low blood sugar. High blood sugar. Hmm. <coughs> I think that one of the problems with the P5P model is the infrastructure itself of mailing lists uh, tends to uh, uh, push people into a, um, you know, I say this, but I say that, but I say this, but I say that, you know, mm -hmm. kind of heads banging against each other and not really resolving anything. Uh, there's various kinds of work. Uh, Horst Ritter did his IBIS project, and there's wikis and things like that that are used to try and resolve things and give people a place to put their argument as best possible and then they, they can go move on to something else. So you might want to look into some of that. Yes, yeah, so we're already planning to do some of that, that sort of thing. Each working group will have somebody in charge um, who makes the final decisions. Um, we will have uh, uh, mailing lists which are, are at least two-tiered in that they, they will have you know, official inner ringers uh, and and but anybody can listen in and con contribute second indirectly if they want to contribute through to the actual working group via uh, the, the people who are actually on the on the working group. Um, we want to have an official um, RFC sort of kind of mechanism for you know not just this you know sort of off the top of your head. Oh, I you know wouldn't it be nice if wouldn't it be nice if that the other thing. If you have a, a, a real proposal for a, uh, a feature, um, make a you know an official proposal in an official place uh, with with uh, uh, all the things that, that make it an official proposal, um, and uh, you know. I guess that's that's it about time. Uh, thank you for taking on this endeavor. Can you hint at any language changes that you're considering? Um, no, I, I hinted at some of them. Uh, you know, everything is negotiable, um, but you know, er everything will not be traded away. Uh, on, a, on a philosophical level, I uh, I have the the profound feeling that if I like something, other people will like it, and if I don't like something, other people probably don't like it so much. And so I, I really trust my instincts on on where things will be going. And I'll, I'll be getting a lot of feedback on that, too. I have, we've been getting a lot of feedback for the last 10 years on things that people you know, think are, are kind of grody. Uh, for instance, I mean, there's really no reason why formats should be in the core anymore. They should be a, you know, Come in as a, as, a, as a module. Um, there are uh, things that could be done, perhaps to, to clean up ambiguities in indirect object syntax. 
Um, there's, um, you know, basically what we are are saying at this point is if if we are going to bite the ba- bite the bullet and require translation of Perl five to Perl six, that really means that we can consider anything that still allows us to translate most scripts. Now we do not expect to be able to translate 100%, but if I if we can translate you know, with 95% accuracy, 95% of the scripts, um, and 100% accuracy, 80% of the scripts. And that, that, that's getting in the ballpark. Um, but uh, you know, on the other hand, sometimes you have to uh, you know, break a few somethings or other to make an omelet. Um, other specific features? Remember any of the ones we named? named? Well, yeah, uh, you know, think about all the things that other other languages say yeah, yeah, yeah about, and, and maybe we'll consider doing those. Um, <laughs> you know, byte compilation is, is a standard way of doing things rather than sort of a you know second cousin. Um, we are going to seriously look at uh, at uh, mark and sweep garbage collection and. The, uh, uh, the possibility of, of separating out the functionality of, of how you finalize things from destructors. Um, you know, what, what, it, that, that, that sort of thing becomes a little harder to write a translator to translate Perl 5 into Perl 6 in. So there's, there's various trade-offs there. Uh, and language decisions like that are, are never easy. Uh, but uh, Somewhere in there, we, we draw the line between, okay, it's really easy to, to, to fix these things, and it's hard to fix these things. Here's the ones in the middle that we have to really think hard about. Um, one of the problems with language translators is you lose all the comments and formatting and things like Not that. Not the Octopearl translator. I wrote that. Well, can you make sure that'll be uh, the way it works in the Pro 5 to Pro well, 6? It, it, may, it may lose some of the formatting information, but um, th- there's ways to annotate a syntax tree with, with additional information. You know, and if we have to get a little incestuous with the compiler and turn off certain optimizations to, to get a more pristine syntax tree to translate that, we, lots of things like that can be done. I mean, this, this, is, this is a subject that I... I I enjoy doing things like that, so I don't think you need to worry about uh, <laughs> that not getting done uh, reasonably adequately. Gentlemen on the far, far side. Yes. <laughs> the question was, is there a possibility of a switch statement? Uh, <laughs> there's, there's always been the possibility of a switch statement. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, uh, certainly. <laughs> I'm not going to promise it. <laughs> you guys work this right, I can get lots of Pepsi here. Yeah, right here. Sorry, they're right here in the bag. Um, we intend to be our own standards body. Dan? Um, I somewhat disagree with your bracketing and indentation style, but respect your right to observe your particular religion. With the automatic language translation that you're having, well, I have within reason the ability to observe my religion. Uh. Whoa. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Mark, how long have 
How long have you been thinking about doing this? Uh, how long have you been stewing on it? Since yesterday. <laughs> Are you contemplating any changes to pod? Everything is negotiable. Uh, you said you wish to steal from some languages. Which languages in particular over the last decade? Yeah, Cobol, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Identification division, yeah. So I always wanted an identification division. Uh, yeah. No, really, I don't want an identification division. The problem with identification divisions is, is it really puts a crimp in, in Perl poetry, or in, in Cobol poetry. How many poems can you start off identification division? Eh? <laughs> One, yeah. Uh, well, what's your favorite language? Besides Pearl. Besides Pearl. Yeah, well, okay. You know, uh, lots, of, lots of languages do a, a, a more of a bytecode thing. And some of these things, a lot of these things are um, not borrowing from a specific language. There's multiple languages that do, do the bytecode thing. Uh, uh, there's, there's Various languages with a cleaner object interface to their I/O and such. There's lots of uh, uh, languages that uh, I don't know, do various things, but uh, we when when uh, something like you know, when you see all the, all the new languages coming out and they all have a garbage collector, you know, and that helps them fit together and into like browsers and things like, like that better. You start thinking, well, maybe, maybe we ought to think about that. Yeah. Larry, um, more and more people, of course, are using Perl today to write larger and larger software. Um, is there anything in Perl, think, Perl 6 that you can think of a fan that might make that easier? Um, large software tend to, have, tend to appreciate things like stronger type checking, checking for example. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, you know, we already got the hooks in there to start putting some some type things in there optionally, and you know you could you could have a use strict type checking if you wanted to pragma, or use stricter or something. Uh, <laughs> you, you use use the uh, you know bondage and discipline, I, whatever you want to call the module. Um, but uh, um, yeah, and. Uh, also part of the redesign, here's, here's a biggie. Um, we intend to get rid of quite a few of those strange global variables, or you know, the strange ones. <laughs> we will certainly get rid of dollar sharp. Okay, that was the last question. Okay, thank you very much, and there'll be more questions tomorrow.